Hola amigos, ¿cómo están? Hey guys, hope everybody's doing well. I just wanted to do something a little different this week. Um, you know, I get a lot of questions on the, the, the YouTube channel and on the Language Tutor Spanish Facebook page. And um, I decided, I, you know, let's take a break from new lessons and um, let's answer some questions. So in this video, I'm going to be answering the top seven questions that I get from people either on the YouTube channel or on the Language Tutor Spanish Facebook page. And by the way, if you haven't jumped on there, um, you know, join the Language Tutor uh, Spanish Facebook page. It's a great little community there. And uh, people are able to ask questions like, hey, is this sentence right? Or am I doing this correctly? Somebody help me with this. And there's a great community of people out there. A few thousand people are on that channel, on that page now on Facebook. So we have a super community of uh, Language Tutor Amigos out there. So jump on there and uh, ask some questions, have some dialogue. Before I get going, I want to just say a very big, big thank you. I, I have been getting some, some donations um, coming in from viewers who are supporting the YouTube channel, and I just can't say thank you enough. I mean, really, I've, I've been, I see on my phone that, you know, a donation came in and I just go, wow, what a great, it's, it's just a great community of people who are supporting me. So thank you very much. This is a shout out to every single one of you. Uh, you know who you are, and I've seen your names coming in. Thank you so much. And also, I've been asked to give a quick shout out to Jesse. So, Jesse, how's it going, man? Hola. All right, well, let's jump right in. The first question I want to answer in this episode is, is the V pronounced like a V or is it a B? Well, that is the eternal question. I get this all the time. It depends on where you are. Because if you're in Mexico, that V is definitely going to sound like a B. Um, in some other countries, it will sound like our V. And you guys know Robin, who did a lesson on my channel. And by the way, she'll be on the channel a lot more in the near future. But, uh, you know, Robin grew up in Chile. And her V is pretty much like our V in the United States. So I've also heard people speak Spanish who will pronounce the V like an in-between, you know, like a, it's kind of like a B, but it's softer. And so, you know, they might say, let's go like vamos, it's softer than a, our B, but still putting the lips together. So, you know, learn the word, learn how to spell it and, and adapt to the country where you go. If you, if you pronounce it like a B, they're going to understand. If you pronounce it like a V, they're going to understand. So that's really not a big deal. All right. Next question. Question number two. How can I increase my vocabulary? Now, I have a couple of strategies for this that I like to tell people. The first one is do topical sections. Take a topic and say, you know what? This week, I'm going to learn every single word that I can learn about the house or everything that I would see in a classroom. Or it might be everything I would see in an amusement park. Um, it, you can just take tons of different topics and you'll, you'll see on my channel that I, I do groups with various topics as well, but that's, that's one of the best things you can do is take a topic. All right. This week, there's my topic and brainstorm every single word you can think of that relates to that topic. And the most important thing is to have conversation, bring it into your conversation and use them as much as possible. Because as I've said on the channel many times, you know, memorization is low level brain functioning. The speaking, the summary, the analysis, breaking things down is higher level thinking. It's higher uh, cognitive functioning. And that's the part that really helps you internalize the word and, and learn it in a way that's going to stay with you. OK. Question number three. How do I know if a verb is a regular verb? an irregular verb, or a stem changer? That's a great question. In terms of irregular verbs, there's not a great way to just look at a verb and go, oh, that's an irregular verb. It's one of those things where you have to take a verb and you have to look at the, the, the conjugations of it and, and you realize, oh, here's some, this is irregular. Okay, and you can even, 
you know, Google irregular verbs in Spanish and get nice little lists that are grouped together. But once you get a verb's conjugations down, uh, and typically they're going to be irregular in the present tense, then Again, memorize it, but use it all the time. When you're driving down the road, you know, use it. Think of conversations that and sentences that will allow you to use those verbs in context because the more you use it and you internalize it, it's not going to sound right another way. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the same for stem changers. You have to learn these verbs are stem changers, but practice them. It's, you know, for me, for example, like if I were using the verb jugar to play, you know, to me, it would it would sound really crazy to say yo jugo and try to conjugate it normally. It, I know that jugo means juice. And so that, that's not going to work. Say like I juiced. So uh, if I practice it enough, I, I know that it's only going to sound right to me to say yo juego. All right. So that's the key. Initially learn it, practice it, internalize it. Okay. Someone on the Language Tutor Spanish Facebook page asked me, are there actual transcripts available for the Spanish lessons on the YouTube channel? And the answer to that is no. I'm sorry. <laughs> there, there are no transcripts available. <clears throat> I tend to make notes when I film. I make notes. Uh, they're kind of bulleted notes and just things in order with examples. And I put the, the computer right next to the camera. And, you know, you can see me kind of glancing next to the camera. That's because I'm looking at my teleprompter, which is my laptop. So I use those notes to film. And then if I'm going to do a podcast episode that goes with that particular lesson, I'll use those notes to put together the podcast episode and then their history. So I don't really keep those after, after I'm totally done with them and I move on to something else. So I know you can turn on captions on YouTube and they're not always accurate. And, you know, I hate that. I'm sorry about that, but there are not transcripts available. So sorry about that. OK, the next question is book recommendations. I get all the time people asking me, tell me some good books that will allow me to practice Spanish or learn grammar or something like that. Well, I'm going to give you some book recommendations really quick. First of all, you know that I'm going to recommend, if you've seen me do Q&As before, you know that I'm going to recommend 501 Spanish Verbs by Dr. Kendrick. Uh, this is a super, super book that allows you to look at 501 verbs in the seven simple tenses, the seven compound tenses, plus you know the gerund form. Um, you've, got, you've got mandates on there, mandatos, and it just is a super book to look at verbs in all conjugations and forms. So that's my number one recommendation if you're working on grammar. Now, my friend up north and here in the United States, Steve Weedmeyer, sent me some great recommendations. I had the, the privilege of talking to Steve um, a while back over Zoom, and he just gave me some great recommendations. So I've been looking at those. I've got them written down here. So first of all, he recommends First Spanish Readers for Beginner. First Spanish Reader for Beginners. There we go. Bilingual for Speakers of English. And he also recommends Volume 2. This is great. It's if One of the best ways you can pick up Spanish context, vocabulary, everything, is reading. Okay? When I was learning Spanish in college, um, usually we had 20 to 30 pages of old Spanish to learn a night to, to read through. And let me tell you, I can't tell you how much Spanish I learned through that process, but um, this is a great one because readers give you real context, real words and phrases that are used in everyday language. So that's a great book there. Now, he also recommends Learn Spanish with Beginner Stories, Interlinear Spanish to English, and Interlinear, yes, okay, and Short Stories. That's right, Beginner Stories and Short Stories. Okay, so those are my buddy Steve's recommendation. Now, also, um, I've been doing some searches for good books, and you know, I've not used these personally because they're relatively new um, or new editions, and I haven't personally looked through them. But I'm looking at ones that have really good recommendations and reviews. There's one called Spanish Grammar for Beginners. Uh, it looks like a really good book, and also. There's a series called Practice Makes Perfect. 
there's a practice makes perfect Spanish conversation, and there's a practice makes perfect Spanish grammar. And also there's the complete Spanish step-by-step. -step. Now, also, I saw one called Conversational Spanish Dialogues. This one looked really cool. Uh, dialogues, again, real context, everyday Spanish in real context. So those are some good books you may want to check out. And also on the Language Tutor Spanish Facebook page, get in touch with Dr. Dan Hall. He and I did a Q&A session a while back for his YouTube channel, which is all about how to learn. So go on there, look up Dan Hall and get his book as well. He sent me a copy of it. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but Dr. Dan Hall has written a great practice book. And I have uh, talked all about that. If you look at a previous video, um, many lessons back, you'll see my discussion of Dr. Dan Hall's book. So that, that's a great one. Next up, the next question is, how effective is Rosetta Stone, Duolingo, or Pimsleur? Well, I have tried all of these, and they all have very good sides to them. So this is completely an opinion question. That's all it is, an opinion. Rosetta Stone, I think, is good for... Uh, assimilation, like I'm seeing this word and I'm seeing this word and I'm seeing a picture and I'm matching them up and that helps me start to retain words for images, vocabulary words, and uh, it might be family, you know, again, topical uh, words. So if you're going to do Rosetta Stone, uh, I believe some of the later uh, versions allow you to speak and get feedback and things like that. I have not personally gone very far with Rosetta Stone. I tried it many years ago with German uh, just to see what it was like. And so it seems to be effective. But again, the most important thing is speak the language, find somebody to speak with. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Duolingo seems to work very similar to Rosetta Stone. I think Duolingo is great for filling in the gaps. I mean, you know, with my students, I teach units and then they, I'll, I'll encourage them to do some Duolingo to help them fill in uh, little filler words, prepositions, uh, things like that, different types of pronouns. And so I think that's pretty good program to help fill in the gaps. Now, Pimsleur, uh, Robin and I field tested Pimsleur several years back and we field tested it in Hebrew. Yeah, Hebrew. It was an interesting choice, but I tried it in Hebrew because I, other than, you know, studying the Bible and things like that, I haven't really done a lot with Hebrew. So I wanted to start with uh, a language I didn't know a whole lot about. I tried 10 days of Pimsleur. I'm going to be honest. I was a little surprised at how much I knew at the end of 10 days. Pimsleur is going to do a lot of learn this, repeat it. Now I'm going to bring in something else, go back and repeat this whole thing. Now I learned something else. Now let's go back and get all of that. And so it gradually builds on what you've learned and keeps you repeating what you've already learned. So I was a little surprised at what I had learned over 10 days in Hebrew. Okay. Now, finally, question number one, the big question here is, how can I practice Spanish? I don't have any Spanish speakers around. And also I saw somebody today um, on the Facebook page said, you know, I've heard that you can't really be fluent unless you go to a Spanish speaking country. Is that true? Well, all of this sort of goes together. <clears throat> if you want to practice Spanish, I'm going to say, if you can go to a Spanish speaking country and spend time, that's the best thing. Immerse yourself. That is the absolute best way to do it. But Nowadays, when we have the digital age, we can immerse ourselves uh, without leaving our homes. There are programs, websites that allow you to pair up with somebody who's a native speaker. I know some of you have seen me talk about polyglotclub.com. That is a site where it, it's almost like Facebook for language, you know, instead of sending friend requests and all that, it pairs you up with people who are compatible with you, maybe similar interests. 
and you can message them and approach them about practicing with you. Now, you might end up having to do a trade-off where sometimes you practice English with them and they practice Spanish with you, but that's okay. The key is steady daily practice. It, it needs to be consistent, steady, and daily. So that's a good site, and there are others that will pair you up with people who can practice. So, you know, Google that. I know italki is one, but I think I think you have to pay for that one. I could be wrong. Um, but definitely investigate that. I, I love polyglotclub.com. It seems to be great uh, for pairing you up. So I believe, yes, it it is technically possible to become a native speaker, or not a native speaker, a, a fluent speaker uh, and not be in a Spanish speaking country. But it is definitely better to do so if you can. Um, I think back to when I was 16 and I stayed in France for several weeks. Um, I spoke it a lot, spoke French a lot, and that was an enormous help for me in progressing because I had only taken up to French one at that point in high school. And so I was able to progress a great deal that summer. Um, but anyways, you know, get online, practice if you don't have anybody around. And the best thing to do is speak all the time. Speak all the time. Never stop speaking. Form sentence. Um, and supplement it. I did a Q&A session a while back, and I think it was a live session uh, on YouTube. And I talked about mock conversations. Mock conversations are when you're driving in your car or you're cleaning the house or whatever, and you just have a mock conversation in your head. Pretend you're having a conversation and you're saying something and another person is saying something. You're just imagining a conversation, but you're doing so in Spanish. And you're going to realize, oh, wait, I don't know that word. Okay, I need to jot that down. Then you come across another one. Oh, wait, I don't know that word jot it down. So this helps you come across real words that you would use in real context in a real conversation, and it helps you bring them in to your own conversations. So that's a great thing to do also to supplement your daily practice. Well, guys, that's it for my top seven questions. I hope this has been beneficial to you. I hope it's helped you progress a little bit in your strategies of learning Spanish. But the biggest thing is practice all the time. And I'll be back next week with another grammar lesson, another Spanish lesson, all right? So in the meantime, I wish for all of you, your family, your friends, everybody, paz y bendiciones, peace and blessing. I appreciate every single one of you. I love you. I thank you for all your support. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you in the next lesson. Friends, thanks for watching The Language Tutor. If you have a question for me, feel free to leave it in the comment section below the video. And please click subscribe and the notification bell so that you'll never miss any of our language lessons.